Hi, and welcome to this Zoom event replay. My name is Richard Andrew. I'm the owner of Learn, Implement, Share. This year, I've been interviewing education leaders whose work pushes the envelope of what's possible in education. One of my interests is guiding teachers to become better at fostering agency in students, and I've worked extensively with mathematics departments. However, what inspires me the most is collaborating with organisations to create learning journeys that bring about meaningful change in people so that they become empowered, so that they have greater impact on the people around them, and then as a result, they become more passionate in their work. Now, one leader who is exceptional at empowering the people around him is Doug Braden. Doug is the principal at Faith Lutheran College in Queensland, Australia, and I interviewed Doug for this event on the 9th of July, 2023. Doug has a diverse background in education, in leadership development, and in law enforcement. After all, he spent 10 years as a detective with the Queensland Police Service. He's a thought leader who challenges the status quo and is an advocate for progressive education, fostering a culture of lifelong learning, curiosity, and growth. Doug is dedicated in dismantling the industrial model of education. He is committed to creating a lighthouse school for others to follow. So, with all that said, welcome to this insightful discussion with Doug Braden, and I sincerely hope you enjoy this as much as I did. So, welcome, Doug. I asked you a question off, sort of off air. Is there much of a connection between being a detective and being a principal, and you said, I don't think I could be as effective as a principal if I hadn't been a detective. So perhaps that's a good place to start. Yeah, okay, well, thanks. Um, you, as I, I said to you before, you're gonna have to keep track of me. I have a habit of just talking and talking and talking. That's so, fine. Yeah, so I was a detective for about 10 years. I was a teacher first, and then I went to teaching after that. I think a lot of things about teachers is that when we become principals, um, we were trained as educators. I've got a maths degree and an education degree. But then all of a sudden you're put in front of a $30 million business and um, you're the CEO of that business. So a lot of the translatable skills I have as a detective helped me running that business that I wouldn't have had otherwise. I'd probably say particularly around behaviour management of students and policies and procedures and natural justice and procedural fairness. They're probably the things that I carry with me that if it wasn't for my experience as a detective, I wouldn't have, you know. And I, so I think we bring a lot of skills from outside of teaching to the role of principal. Um, and so I think anyone that's becoming a principal who's got experiences outside of education, I mean, they're all translatable skills in different yeah. contexts. Yeah. Fantastic. One other piece of logistics here. We've got Jen Gibb, who's on camera as well. Hi, Jen. Um, I had sort of half planned to do a three-way chat and another session, more than happy for you to be on here. So stay stay with the camera on. If you want to uh, say anything, then no, that's fine. But I, I think um, Doug's going to have a fair bit to uh, to chat about. So let's just... I think roll. Doug's got it covered. But you feel free to stay there. So glad glad to see you. Um, in your about, so that, that introduction that I read through was basically Doug's about page on LinkedIn. And in there... You, you said that you're dedicated to dismantling the industrial model of education. Would mm -hmm. you like to unpack that for a few minutes? Yes. Okay. So I think most educators know, I think especially those that reflect upon the current way of education and we can see the mass levels of disengagement amongst students across yeah. the nation. I think we can also see by um, the mass transit of teachers from the profession that something has to change. Yeah. Um, I always find it interesting that schools harp on about 21st century learning. And if we're honest, we can hardly see that happening in any school. And we're a quarter of a century of the way into the 21st century. So I think that the only difference from the 1950s to now is that we see laptops on desks in rows. Um, there's not much different that has changed in education. So things have to change. And you mentioned student agency and voice. It's pretty hard to have student agency and voice in the current system of education we have in Australia. It's very difficult. So things do have to change. And so I am very committed to dismantling that. 
Um, and I think principals are very well placed to make that possible because it is a very hard job. And one of the things that I want, I'm hoping out of this chat is if there are leaders who watch this either live or as a replay who want to bring about some transformation in, in their school that they can get some tips because I know you've got some and I've got them jotted down here and I want to ask. Yeah. Um, okay, what I want so to say before you ask next, like one of the things I've tried to do at Faith, and this is probably important to know, is that there's lots of boutique schools around the world that are doing amazing things. Yeah, yeah. But we really wanted to create a system when, where it can be a large mainstream school doing something different. So right. that was a key factor for us is that how do you do school differently for a large school? Uh, we've got about 820 students at our school. So it's, right. not a, it's not a huge high school by any standard, but it's certainly not a small school. Yeah, so that's an, that's an important um, note to make. Right. And we'll come back to that. You also uh, state that you're a challenger of the status quo, which I like to um, wear that mm -hmm. hat as well, as I'm mm -hmm. sure does Jen. What does that mean for you and why is that important? Um, I'm not content with doing the same thing. I get itchy feet. That's probably a part of who I am. Um, I don't like following the status quo. I think education is all about change. We expect kids changing their perspectives and beliefs about themselves and the world. Education needs to do the same thing. So uh, I'm passionate about change. I don't like doing the same things all the time. I think we've got to constantly reflect and refine and change. Um, it's just who I am. Let me be devil's advocate here. Some people might say, oh, so you're into, into change just for the sake of change. Like, mm. you know, let's, let's change just because we need to change. It, it, what would you mm. say to that? Oh, that's no, that's, that's, not, that's not correct. I think for us, like our vision statement at our school is, is to awaken potential and to empower learners for purposeful lives through Christ. So, right. you know, to actually empower and yep. to awaken um, requires us to change as the students are changing. Right. And that's really important. Right. Another line in your, or another phrase in your about section is innovative learning environments. Mm -hmm. Now that could be seen as rhetoric. I oh, know it's yes. not in your case. Yeah. So yeah. what, what does a faith version of an innovative learning environment? Right. Oh, now I know this is a huge yeah, question. A huge I, question. I, I just want to just touch on it as a teaser yeah. and then we'll unpack it. Yeah. I don't necessarily think it's talking about physical environment. That's probably the first note to make. Okay. So it's not just about physical. I've seen enough schools of amazing buildings doing nothing different to any other school. Yeah. I think it's just about creating that learning environment that, that is different. So for instance, at our school, um, and I mean, we've got to unpack this a bit more, is that we have three phases. We have a foundation phase, an exploration phase, and a graduate phase. Um, our foundation phase is run very differently. It's, it's very similar to taking the best things about primary school and the best things about secondary school and joining them together. And we can That's talk about a, Is that year seven, eight? Yeah, year seven, eight. Yeah. Right. And year nine to 10 is exploration phase and 11 and 12 is graduate phase. But it's important to note, really, there is no year levels from year nine to 12. So there's a there's a there's an ability for students to go between exploration and graduate phase, um, and there's a lot of work that's been done in the systems and structures behind that to allow that to be possible. Um, can we can we go there, but not just yet? Yeah, yeah, we have to go there. Yeah, yeah, we have to go there. And and mm -hmm. and Jen's laughing, and um um because I, I know that's a big thing. But what what I would like to go to next or first is your first year at faith and i know we chatted about mm -hmm. this last time yeah. because you've been there this is your fourth year correct yes, that's correct yeah yeah so can you talk a little bit about what faith was like before you came what attracted you to come to faith and your first year because I, I know this is a really interesting story you know what you did how, how you tackled because you obviously had a vision mm -hmm. but how like and this is a message for any any leaders who really want to turn around a industrial model of school, if, uh, for want of a better term. Mm. Um, so, mm. what was your what's your first year at Faith story? Okay. Well, well first of all, I'd say Faith Leader in College was like every other school. It, it was. Uh, yep, just like every other school. Year seven to twelve, 
um, different grades, trying their best to integrate subjects in the lower grades, but not really doing very well at it, to be honest. Um, year nine and 10 uh, is, that, is that middle part of schooling in Australia where kids get lost. Yeah. Um, they often talk about in middle years of school and that, that learning goes backwards or stops um, and their development seems to stop around that period of time. And then when kids go into year 11 and 12, you know, that's when they can make all their choices for subjects. So let's stick through with year nine and 10. But when you get to year 11, you can choose all the subjects. So it was no different to any other school, state school, independent school, the same sort of thing. About yeah. 600 kids back then. Um, we've got about 820 now. Um, but the journey to changing things started well before that. So I was head of middle school at Westmoreton Anglican College. Right. And, and um, it was at that point that I wanted to make changes but it's very hard to make changes isolated. Does that make sense? So you can make changes in a school that is isolated from the whole school, but those changes never become sustainable. They yes. never become permanent. They, they can disappear. And yeah. so one of the things for me was whatever change we make has to continue when I leave. Right. Um, that was really important for me. So, but when I got to faith, um, what attracted to me to faith? Yeah. Um, I would say that God lifted me up from my previous place and yeah. deposited me here. Um, and I think it was for the right reasons. I, I, I think that not realizing what I was going into faith, our community at faith here is amazing. The parents and the students are amazing and very supportive. I don't think that it would have been, I would have had an easier time to make the changes I've had had I been in a metropolitan school, yeah. the parent body and the student body here was very open and ready for change. So it was You're, a perfect, it was a perfect timing. Yeah. It was a perfect timing for me to hit to do what I need to do here. How many kilometers inland from the coast are you? So you've got Brisbane, you've got Ipswich, and you've got Toowoomba. Right. It's sort of in between all three. Okay. So it's about it's about half an hour from Ipswich about half an hour from the western suburbs of Brisbane right. and about 40 minutes from Toowoomba. So it's in between those three major right. centres. Yeah, But it's not necessarily the location, because you said if I was in a, in a metropolitan school. Mm. It, mm. What is it, I, I'm assuming it just happened to be the right, just the right um, ingredients. Yes. Happened, yeah. It happened, like I said, it could, have, it could have been a metropolitan school like that, maybe, I don't know. It been, it, it's just the, per, it's the perfect ingredients right. for the right time. And so... Do you think the parents were looking for change even though they might may not have been voicing it or what? Our parent body is a very accepting parent body. Okay. Very supportive, very good community. Right. So um, there's trust. So I came into the school and trust was already there. Didn't have to try to build the trust with the parents. The parents already had trust. So that made it very easy. Did, did they know a friendly tornado was coming when, when you were appointed or did they find out once you were there? Probably. <laughs> that once once or, we started, there is some, there's some staff members here that I can sign on. They'd be able to better under, answer the question. <laughs> but so, okay. So, so you, you, your first year, like let, yeah. what, what's your advice to, let's say, oh, I'm, let's say I'm a, a principal of a fairly conservative school and it's frustrating yes. me and I, and I, and I want, I want to, want to make a big change. Where, where do we start? Do we start with the parent body? Do we start with the you got to start. I think you got to start with the why. I know this. Is, I know everyone harps on about Simon Sinek, but you got to start with the why. Yeah. You got to build the case for why. Uh, you know, leadership is about building the case for why and helping people transition yeah. from point A to point B. So you know that's where you have to start. So um, I suspected. I'm very much. I'm a maths teacher, probably like you are. So I start with data. Yeah. That's the first thing where I started, and 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 when I and there was a lot of absence of data, but what data I could see indicated that there was a strong problem that needed to be addressing yep. um, but I but I also knew that um, if I came in and made changes widespread changes yep. um, it may not be received very well so we yep. had an independent school review done first that was the first thing okay. so my recommendation to anyone that wants to change is to do an independent school review first and what now are they just looking when you say data are they just looking at results or are they looking at the engagement yeah. level of kids and engagement and levels everything and so is that through surveys of students or? Yeah. Yep. So part of it is level of achievements. So part of it is our NAPLAN results. Yeah. Part of it is for, from student attitudes through surveys. Uh -huh. 
um, part of it's through parent surveys. So there's lots of forms of data. Right. Um, yeah, but I, I can't over emphasize the importance for an independent review yep. um, because that then takes me out of the equation. They present their findings and the findings were the same as what I thought, you know. Which actually, was in summary, well, uh, in summary um, lack of clarity around vision. Okay, so that's right. probably that's a leadership issue. Yep. Um, so lack of uh, clarity around vision, um, inefficient leadership structures. Uh, and and curriculum changes yeah so they're probably the three major ones was uh leadership structures and the lack of clarity around vision um so that sort of gave permission to actually make some changes so uh, then but that that doesn't to me sound like uh you, you're going to have you know a, essentially abolish year levels between year nine and 12 and no, no, and, and no. all that sort of stuff so how, how does how do you transition from the um the independent review to what, yep. what you've got now you focus on vision first always vision what do we want which is the why it's going to be so that's the why yeah and so when our vision statement is awakened potential and empower learners oh. that opens up everything and so was that a staff sorry is that a staff collaborative yes and, and with college council so our board right. yeah so but a lot of these things happen simultaneously so we did timetable changes and leadership structure changes with with independent with independent assistance there at the same time knowing we sort of had an idea as a school where we wanted to go right. but if we waited to do the the vision first and then do everything else it would have been a long long process so we were sort of doing three or four things simultaneously at the yeah. same time. Um, now, we we all generally had a, a pretty good idea of what we wanted, but we just didn't, we didn't have the vision statement articulated until year two. Question. Yeah. I've never thought about this before, but I'm going to ask you because I think you might have an answer. How do you get a vision that is more than just a piece of rhetoric? Because I've been in yeah. schools where they have a vision and no one, like I wouldn't even know what it no. is. Except no. that someone's no. answered every now and then and think, oh, yeah. But, you know, even though we may have had a workshop, I'm not thinking in my head when I'm planning my lessons or whatever yeah. of the vision. But but I know some schools do, yeah. and, I, yeah. and I suspect yeah. yours has. Yeah. How, how, do the, how do you do that? Okay, so I think um, the places that do vision really well are not-for-profit charity organisations with volunteers. So it's really hard to run a volunteer organisation. So if you want to see really good vision statements, oh. go to volunteer organisations like Compassion and wherever and see what their vision statement is and how do they actually mobilise a volunteer task force. Like, like it's hard. Yeah. So I think the key to vision casting is making it simple and portable. It's got to be easy to remember. So yeah. if you've got a, a paragraph that's your vision statement, no one will ever remember it. Yeah. It's got to be really simple. So for me... There's four words to our vision statement. Awaken, empower, purpose, and Christ. Right. Easy to remember. Yep. Easy, easy as to remember. The difficulty then, though, becomes is, like, what does empower actually mean? Yes. What, is, know, what, is, what does that actually empower? mean? Yeah, what does empower mean? What does awaken mean? And if we really believe it, how far are we going to push this? Because this is the thing with high schools in particular, is that we do a whole bunch of stuff because it's tradition. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to relook at every single thing that you do in the school and go, if this doesn't move us closer to the vision, we must stop it. So we have to be wedded to that vision. What's and the third one? So what's the third word? So purpose. Oh, purpose. Right. Christ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that has to be the wind tunnel for everything. It just right. has to be. So our uniform policies, our mobile phone policies, you know, um, our budget, we actually went through our budget. If you want to know where, what a school believes, look at what they spend their money on. So that's another thing that we really did. And we went through that and we went through that with fine tooth comb and we've restructured even our finances to be in, in line with that vision statement. That's it a, changes that's, everything. That's a good tip right there. If, it's, yeah. if, a leader, if a leader wants to look at transformation, have a look at what they're spending their money on. Yeah. Hey, look, I want to throw in a red herring here, which mm -hmm. I heard this. I can't remember his name. Um, it's a fantastic interview. And he was saying, he's a, he's a Chinese guy, a real innovator. And he's saying, education needs to move from just in case 
education to just in time education and most education is just in case we teach a whole lot of math stuff just in case they get to need it we, we you know we teach them a whole lot of content just yeah. in case kids need it and yeah. i suspect that your focus because this gets into the empower part and probably the awaken part and probably the purpose part i suspect i know i'm guessing here but that, that you're moving into the realm of uh just in time education we've never thought of it that way yeah it's not something that we've thought of it's always been through the vision of how do we empower how do we awaken so we've never thought of it that way just in time i'd have to think a bit about that okay Um, yeah but i don't have a answer for you i'd have to think about what that actually means just in time but yeah everything has been around how do we awaken and how do we empower Um, I, i think it means I mean, this sort of leads into more problem-based learning and having kids, you mm. know. Um, and I, I, do, do you do that from nine to 12? Are students more kind of creating their own adventure a little bit um, in terms of having more yeah. choice in what they're doing? Yes. And, and so, yeah. so, so, so you're, you're giving them more choice and ownership over their yeah. learning curve over those four years? Yeah. Is this a good time to actually explain what we're doing so that... Yes. Has- question good point okay so so foundation phase is year seven and eight right so i suppose the easy first thing is to identify what's probably not working with high schools so a typical high school a teacher in a typical high school will teach two subject areas yeah and teach across multiple grades so as a maths teacher i'm a physics teacher as well i might teach year 9 10 11 12 yeah um, and we have staff meetings Yep. And normally, because every staff member is across two different subject areas, you've got a group. Each Monday, you might have group A subject meetings, group B subject meeting, group C subject meetings. And often, some of the teachers in the maths department might be science teachers or PE teachers, and you don't even have your teachers at the same time. It's very rare in a high school for teachers to meet together collaboratively. Yeah. Like, pretty much never happens. Yes. Um, so one of the th- things that we needed, we knew very early, the only way we can make this work is that it's got to be collaborative. So how, what do we do to allow teachers to be collaborative? Our only solution to this was to ensure that any teacher that teaches year seven only teaches year seven. So we're sort of taking the best things from primary school, which is the relationships yeah. that teachers have with their students and the best things are with high schools, which is the specialised subject areas. So... so- Teachers so, in year seven. Sorry, you go. Sorry. So does that mean that if I'm a year seven teacher, I'm teaching a range of subjects? Could do. Yep. Right. Yep. So in year seven, all the KLAs, all our key learning areas are covered by 10 teachers. Right. In year eight, all the key learning areas are covered by 10 teachers. And so the, the music teachers, the art teachers, the German teachers, the science teachers, the PE teachers, they're all in there and they don't have a split focus. So when the year seven teachers meet, they meet as a team. Right. The other thing, and when the year eight teachers meet, they meet as a team. So we do a very heavy focus on literacy and numeracy right. and also a heavy focus on project-based learning. Yep. Okay, so there's lots of team teaching. Um, the, the environments, the physical environments are conducive to multiple forms of learning. It's very agile. We, they have their own dedicated areas, which could be opened up or closed in depending upon what's required. We've got private spaces for individuals to work, group spaces, explicit teaching spaces, all those sort of things. But those teachers, teachers as a team, um, they have their own planning time and the budget. Now, this is the big thing. I'm a big, I mentioned empowering middle leaders. This is a big thing, is the entire curriculum budget is handed to those leaders. There's There's two curriculum leaders and there's two pastoral leaders in each phase. Yep. There are no heads of departments at our school. We do not silo subject areas. That's the next thing. We do not we do not have subject areas at our school. There's no heads of departments whatsoever. Um, so there's but there's curriculum leaders. The curriculum leaders and the pastoral leaders have their budget. They don't need to ask permission for anything. That's their budget. You can spend it as you wish. You can plan as you wish. And I'm a big believer that when you empower our teachers which our vision statement says empower learners. A yep. learner is a teacher as well. So that vision statement yep. applies to teachers as well. Right. When you empower them, magic happens. So when a teacher is, if, you, if you're a teacher in that team and you're being told, here's your money, you spend it as you wish, you do not need to ask permission, 
here's our vision statement. You meet that vision statement and we'll back you 100%. Magic happens and it has. So it's been amazing what they're doing. At the moment, the year sevens are working with um, elderly folk from the local retirement homes. They're partnering with them, creating digital stories and doing all this sort of stuff. In the in the year eight team, they they've got three D printers and laser cutters, and they're building, they're molding like you know um, chocolate sort of molds. And there's you know anyway, they're doing amazing stuff in there. But it's all it's all them. Because I, I mean, I was saying I said a quick thing at the start. You know, I think if I'm a teacher and my kids don't have agency, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. Um, but, but the, the teachers need agency. But the same applies to teachers. That's right. And it so does. much that I hear about what's going on in certain schools is shutting teachers down and, and yeah. straight jacketing them in you must yeah. do things this way. And yeah. I'm thinking, these are professionals. How can you do that? Yeah, um, if, if you want the students to have agency, the teachers need agency. Yeah. And, th and that's a structural change. And so, sorry, don't please don't lose your thread there. Yeah. <laughs> can I just squeeze this one in? Um, did all this, you've like no heads, th yes. no hods. The, yeah. that, that sounds like a radical thing. I mean, it makes all sense to me, but did you do that in the first year or? or okay. Because okay. <laughs> yes. it sounds yeah. like that you would have spent six months, I don't know, you must have spent a fair bit of time thrashing out your vision statement and whatever. Well, but when, when did the real changes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, I'll go back a little bit. Lutheran education is committed to contemporary transformation. Um, and so we send our staff all around Australia, around the world, looking at schools. So right. we, made a, we made a decision. Our PD budget is going to be spent sending teachers to innovative schools. Okay. Because we want to win hearts and minds of our teachers. Let's see what other schools are doing that are amazing. So we've had teachers in New Zealand, America. Um, you know, I'm going over to um, over to the UK soon and, and the US again. But our teachers are going all around Australia looking at different schools. So there's a massive there's a massive um, emphasis on that. Probably the biggest takeaway over the last few years for me is that what are the barriers that prevent innovation? And one of the biggest one was the siloing of subject areas was right. one of the biggest ones. So I knew that a long time ago that we had to remove heads of departments. In nearly every context I've worked in in a school where we've tried to drive change, the biggest barriers, and this is no offence to heads of departments, it was the heads of departments because there's this protection of the subject. So um, we I had to remove that. So protecting this... We teach students, not subjects. So that's yeah. the other thing that was important for me. So de-siloing subject areas was really important. I had to get rid of heads of departments. So in the first year, we did an entire leadership restructure, which meant that all the current leadership roles became abolished and new roles were created. So you, you, can, you can imagine how, how, how popular I was in the first year. So yeah, that was the first year. That but it was the 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 in the independent experts we had coming in to assist me, they said you need to do this as a band-aid, you need to rip it off. If you drag this across more than one year, it's going to affect your leadership. So all of those significant changes had to happen in the first year as a big band-aid ripped off. So, so that was Bill Short. I just made the name up. I hope he's not a, I hope he's not a member of your staff. Yeah. Um so he's up in arms because he's the mass yep. holder and he's losing his position. Yep. So how do you deal with Bill? It's selling vision. Every every right. term, I probably speak twice at school. Yeah. Probably people get tired of hearing the vision statement, but you need to keep doing it. So everyone on my senior leadership team will keep bringing everything back to the vision statement. Everything is argued from the vision statement. And that's that was the key thing. So everything. But in the first year, we didn't have the vision statement but we had guiding principles instead. So we knew yeah. the things that we wanted our school to be and those guiding principles were used to justify every decision. But the staff in, in general, I mean, I can't necessarily speak for them, but I would guess that the staff in general knew that that change had to happen. Right. Yeah, in general. But you've still got leadership roles. Yes. They're just not HODs. No, curriculum leaders. So that so we our, our curriculum leader in year seven was a head of humanities, but she looks after all eight KLAs in in the year seven space. Right. Our year eight curriculum leader is a stem as a stem teacher, 
So she still looks after all eight KLAs. I mean, Jan Gibb is our director of teaching and learning and looks after all curriculum, but she's not an expert in all these different areas. So for some HODs, it, it comes easier. So a head of humanities normally looks after business, economics, legal studies, history. Yeah, yeah. They're used to multidisciplinary teams. The teams that are not used to it are heads of maths and heads of English. For all yeah. heads of maths, so always good. <laughs> I always get it. I can say that because I'm a maths teacher. I've got a maths degree. So, yeah, I can, well, so I'm on. Yeah. Now, one of your statements is the importance of disconnecting teachers from their love of the subject and replacing yes. it with the love for the child. Yes. And so this fits in with uh, removing yes. of heads of, of mm -hmm. departments. So can you talk about the love for the child part? Yeah. Okay. So I'm making a generalization again. Okay. Yep. Primary school teachers become teachers because they love children. Yes. Okay. High school teachers become teachers because they love the subject. Mm. Very big generalization, but yeah. it certainly is true for me. Love maths, love science, become a physics maths teacher. Yeah. As you go through your career as a teacher, your love for the child becomes stronger than love for your for your subject area. That certainly was true for me. Yeah. So recruitment is really important for us. We have three things we look for: kind, smart, and creative. But kindness, kind teachers are number one. So I don't care how smart a teacher is. Yeah. It's, they're not kind. And if they don't love children, they're not going to be in my team. So recruitment is probably the best way to actually drive change too and build that culture oh. is through recruitment. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's one of the, there's a lot of things you're saying here on the surface doesn't like, a teacher's got to be kind, yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. But if you really unpack that, it's so important. Mm -hmm. And we go to such long efforts. I, I, I interview every teacher that comes through to the school. It's too important for me not to. I might interview 15 people for one teacher, but it's so important we get that kind teacher the right. The other thing is, is that we need to, we need to recruit teachers that are able to work in mess because we are building a school that has no... There is no model for it. So we need to have entrepreneurial creatives who are happy to work in the mess because things need to change because we don't have a model. There's a model for a traditional school. There's not a model for a, for a contemporary school. So, so you're, talk, you're talking yeah. about working in chaos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it takes a particular sort of person that loves that who who just who just gets so excited by that. So we 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 heavily look for teachers that love that love working in the mess, love working so if, in the If chaos. I was heavily OCD, I, I probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't get a Guernsey. Oh, uh, depends. Some, <laughs> you know, you know I, I might be OCD, I don't know. <laughs> um, before we get, did you want to say any more about your 7 and 8 program? Yeah, so the, the 7 and 8, that's pro, I pretty much summarised that. Okay, so, you know, very similar to primary school in some ways, maintaining those relationships, Emphasis on project-based learning, but a heavy focus on literacy and numeracy. Year nine. Cause, cause, sorry, because I've always thought in high schools, it's such a, a vicious change from year seven. Well, if yeah, if, if year seven's the yeah. first year in high school, from year six to year seven, and they're so young. Yeah. And it's some kids don't cope with it very well. No. Well, this is perfect. I was actually saying to Jen the other day that um, – our kids that are in year eight, because they've only experienced our foundation phase, they've never experienced a traditional high school yet. So we've got kids in our school that have never experienced what a normal high school is. Right. That's, you know, that that is actually exciting to me that we have students that wouldn't even have a clue what a traditional high school is like. So, but yeah, so next stage is exploration phase. This is the exciting stuff. So this year nine and ten. Nine and ten. Okay. We went to the documents. So can I can I just say to anyone, like if you didn't hear this at the start, this is advertised as a 30-minute session and it's going to be more than 30. I don't know if it's going to go to 60. If you need to drop off and go somewhere, just make sure you check into the event page something about a week's time because I will have the link to the uh, the replay, the timestamp replay, which will be an article. So that's how to get the replay um, if you need to go. Thanks. Okay. So exploration phase in your 9 10. Um, we went to our documents, we're an independent school. What do we actually have to do? Um, as a, as a secondary school, um, we have to teach the Australian curriculum. 
But in year nine and 10, the Australian curriculum talks about a big focus on specialising subjects and for the kids understanding who they are and their place in the world. So the only compulsory subjects are English, maths and science, right. one semester of history and one semester of another humanities subject. That is the base that's required for us to have our accreditation as an independent school. So for us, that's what we do. We teach those as, as compulsory be as innovative as we can in those compulsory subjects, but with everything else, we've opened it up. So we have cross-curricular subjects in, in, in year nine and 10. So as I said, I used to be a detective. So Jen asked me to write a course called Detective Investigations and map it to the Australian curriculum. Right. So I looked at the Queensland Police Manual for Detective Training, and I mapped that to English and Humanities, basically. And then I created a six-month subject for that. Wow. Um, that then went out to the staff and then we asked them who would like to write a cross-curricular subject in any area that you would like. We had about 41 subjects written, no time release given to the teachers. They did it in the love of, of the kids. And we had subjects like conspiracy theories, um, craftsmanship with timber, real estate matters, all these different subjects, all mapped to the Australian curriculum. But the condition was that they, there must be two teachers that can teach it and it has to be mapped properly to the Australian curriculum. Then those 41 subjects were then presented to a course selection committee um, for final approval. Who do you think was on that committee? Uh, you. No. Jen. No. Parents. No. Kids. Yes. Ah, sorry, I was a bit slow okay. there. Okay, so only students, no one else. So we had to present and give a three-minute pitch to the students selling our courses. Was that your post on LinkedIn? Yes. Yeah. That was yours? That was Jen's yeah. post. I put a post too, but her post is better. Um, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. When I say yeah. yours, I meant Faith's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what happened was um, we had to pitch three-minute pitch. Um, I was nervous when I pitched my detective investigations course because, you know, when you're selling something that you're passionate about, you want the kids to love it. And so our teachers were so nervous and the level of questioning from those students about our courses, because ultimately they had the last say. Yeah, wow. If they didn't like it, your subject didn't run. So we had teachers with PhDs writing courses and not every course made it through to the next round. So 41 subjects were then dropped down to 32 uh -huh. students. And then those 32 then had to go through rigorous planning, mapping properly to the Australian curriculum. And then they were then run past our curriculum leaders for to make sure that there was enough rigor in those subjects. Right. Um, and so those were then reduced down to 27. Uh -huh. And then those 27 were added to all of other subjects. So we still run the math subjects, all the normal electors like drama, dance, visual art. Yeah. Um, but we've instead of calling it year nine subjects, those core those those core subjects would be like maths 1A, 1B, maths 2A, maths 2B, science 1A. Science, like science has some cool stuff like there's dinosaurs and megafauna and rocket science and medical science and all these other things, which are cool. But essentially the kids had 88 subjects to choose from. So um, do, do you have a you must have minimum numbers though for a subject? Yes, 13. So they're six month courses, minimum numbers 13 to choose. And, and there was eight, them right. eight semester long subjects. But the thing is, because there's no year levels, any student from year nine to 12 can choose those subjects. Oh, because so, so you're so opening that... up, instead of having 150 kids choosing those subjects, you've got like 600 kids that can choose those subjects essentially. So it so makes it a lot easier. Minimum numbers are easier to hit. Sorry, say again. Makes it a lot easier timetable wise. Yep. yep. And that's the next thing the timetable. So I'm just going to divert to that yep. in order for there to be a transition between exploration phase and graduate phase we needed the timetable to be exactly the same for years nine to twelve six subjects six periods a day so right. it had to be the same so at most high schools you know kids in in the lower grades do more subjects than six to give them an experience right. but then that means different timetable structures for different year levels yep. the only way this worked is if it's the same for year nine to twelve and so if a kid wants to choose math methods in year 11 because they can do it, um, because they've, shown, they've demonstrated capacity to do it, they could be in year nine or going to year 10, choosing math methods, starting that, but still doing some other year 10 subjects. So yeah. they can be on a combination. Or a kid who's been doing dance since they were four could do year 11 dance while they're in year 10. We could have kids in year 10 doing some certificate courses in our VET program 
whilst doing other year 10 subjects. So, because there is no, it's just prerequisites like university. University, you have first year, second year, third year, fourth year, no one knows which one you're in. So you're just part of a cohort of students progressing through, building their academic profile, basically. So that was the key. There's a saying that common sense isn't very common. Yeah. And, um, what I'm hearing, to me, sounds like common sense. Yes, it does. And you don't what, even know why this doesn't happen. What? Yeah, exactly. I don't understand. Well, when I look at it and think, of course you'd make the timetable the same. Of course you would. Because then you can have kids transitioning between grades with no issue yeah. at all. So, but I don't know why it doesn't happen. I mean, there well, is complexity in making things simple. I will say that. That's one of our core values at the school. So what did um, you say? One of our core values at the school is simplicity. Right. So we aggressively pursue um, the reduction of complexity. Right. So, um, because in simplicity, you can have innovation. Yep. But to get things simple can be complex, if that makes sense. Yep. So the more simple you make something, it can be actually quite complicated to make it simple. If that makes sense, does that it, make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, you mean it's a complicated process to make it simple, and then yeah, you need to make it simple. But to, but in order to make it simple, there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes to make it as simple as you can. So that required a complete change of the timetable, which was quite complex. But now that it's done, it's simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jen, look, we need to wind this up, sort of within yeah. the next five or ten. Do, do, Jen, do you want to say anything? No, no pressure. But given that you're here, did you want to? slip anything in to what's being said? Um, I would say that probably the thing that I haven't seen anywhere I've worked before is the vision casting. So taking it back to that importance of vision, Doug's done an excellent job casting the vision. Our staff all know that vision. Yep. Um, and that that really does drive everything. Yep. Um, I'm blown away by our staff. We've got a really smart willing staff that have just got in and done the work this would not be possible with staff that weren't on board and again it's the vision casting and the consultations that have happened um driven by Doug that has allowed that to happen yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I'm just like when I get worried about this because I'm like oh is this the right thing um I just think well what we're currently doing to me isn't working yeah so you know, I, I say to Doug all the time, we can't make it worse. We actually can't make it worse. So, um, you know, the, the yeah, often... so you're you're so you're you're talking about in the beginning stages. That's what. No, you're I, I I'm talking about. I think you know when we have we have senior teachers that would say, oh, but are you preparing them for the you know the general subjects for the QCE for an ATAR pathway? And it's like I don't know if you've taught Year Eleven, but Year Elevens come in and they don't bring much with them from nine and ten. No. You're starting from scratch. You teach them like they know nothing. Yeah. Uh, so our whole focus is let's give kids some power to choose some things that they can that they're interested in and that they can actually attach some purpose to. Because exactly. at the moment, the only thing that drives them is the grade on the report card. Yeah. And how many of the teachers that are online right now use things like, you better listen to this because this is going to be on your test. Yeah. You better do this because you're going your assignment's got to include this. And so that's the only purpose I think the kids can actually attach to some of the learning. So we're hoping that kids will choose things like real estate matters and detective investigations because they're actually really interested in it. And so together with the passion and the expertise of those teachers, with kids that really want to learn, I'm really excited to see yeah. where that goes. So clearly, with these electives that you're running, especially <laughs> the electives, mm. the kids, the kids in those classes. I would guess have got a lot of agency. Like they're, yes. they're inspired. They feel like they've got some control over what they're doing. That mm. they're they're into their learning journey with that with that elective. I, I don't know if they, I don't know if you call them electives, but I'm mm. just calling it. Mm. Um, am I right there? Yeah, we call them courses. Yep. No, Six no, months. I meant I meant the agency bit. Yeah. You know, oh yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, yeah. so percent. And what? And so You've never seen young people so excited. Right. No one's ever asked a year eight what they want to do. So, so what's the and look? I know, I know this might sound a basic question, but I think it's a really important question to ask because I don't think we ask it enough. But what's different? What what is it about what's happening in these electives that allows the kids to have agency that is not happening in your typical classroom in your typical industrial type school? Because I think the teachers stick purely 
to the Australian curriculum and they interpret it as it's written. Whereas we're asking our teachers to reimagine that, look at that curriculum and turn use it, use it, but use it in creative ways, in areas that you have a depth of knowledge so you can actually, you actually do know how to apply that curriculum in creative ways. Yeah. So I think that's, I think, and I think we've got such a breadth because we've got such a breadth of expertise on staff, yeah. the breadth of courses that we're offering. Um, we had 400 parents turn up to our year nine, 10 subject information evening. Wow. Like when does that happen? Yeah. You know? So what would you say, Doug? Like what, what's the magic ingredient um, for creating agency in students? I think the first thing is, is that students have to have a role to play. Right. So that's they got the, some choice. So that's the choice. Like when the, when the students are actually empowered to be present and part of the actual process, like at what school do students, oh, are students on a curriculum committee? Yeah. You know, like when there's not a single teacher on that committee and yeah. they can make the decision whether that subject runs or not. Yeah. You know, like, like I remember Larry, Larry Rosenstock, who's the CEO of High Tech High in California. He yeah. said, um, you know, the trick is to get the kids loving the subject so much what they're doing and then fit in the maths and fit in the English and they don't even realise they're doing it. So that's so, that's the just-in-time piece. Okay, okay. So right. and, and so in my subject, Detective Investigations, I have to mention this, it's the most popular subject. <laughs> and kids want to do it. Of course they do. <laughs> but they, they 110 kids are choosing to have the principal teaching them. You know, so, you know, and, and in that subject... Anyone that's been in police work or detective work knows how much writing and reading you have to do. Like right. the, whole, the whole job is writing. So these kids are going to be doing English, but they're mm. going to be investigating murder, actual real murders. Right. Um, they're going to be really passionate, interested about it. They're not even going to realise that they're doing English as a result of it, you know, yeah. but they're yeah. going to. So yeah. I, I just think the, the level of choice, the other thing I think is really important here that's different is that, the students are not tied to a date of birth range. So most schools group the kids according to date of birth. Our kids are grouped according to interest. And because they're multi-age classes, you'll find a bunch of kids. Like so ideally, you could love science at our school, do the four science courses that they have to do, but then fill up the rest of their electives over the two years with more science subjects if they want. So yes. they could do science 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, yeah, yeah. dinosaurs and megafauna, rocket science, medical science, you know, all those other things, all the other subjects. And then you'll find that those students are hanging out with like-minded students who like the same things. And the so music, music kids, the performing arts kids are going to join to get all of that. So that's different as well. You're not having these arbitrary groupings of students. Yeah. It's going to be more like real life where when I've got my friendship group, I don't ask for their date of birth. Yeah. I'm re I'm choosing friends based on interests, values, character, all that sort of stuff, and so it's more realistic to to how real the real world operates in terms of grouping of peoples. Yeah, and so that works well having year twelves with some year nines and electives. Oh, uh, that's probably not going to be as 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 like that. That those sort of conditions are going to be a little bit less common. Okay, because yeah. the year elevens and twelves will still be focused on on their yep. senior studies. However. The idea is that some of those students in year 10 can start some of the year 11 subjects in year in, in year 10. So yep. that by the time they're in year 12, they have a, a less heavy um, course load for year 12. So there could be some year 12 students. I had some in year 12 saying they want to choose detective investigations because they want to be cops themselves. So there will be, but it's not going to be, like I can't imagine it's going to be widespread where we'll have year 12s in those subjects, but it's possible. Yeah. Right. Um, last couple of minutes, if anyone has a question that you'd like Doug to um, answer, throw it in the chat and I'm just looking at what's here. So some people had to leave thanking you for the um, information. So final words, Doug, did you, have you got anything? I mean, we could, we, okay, could, yep. we could go on the, for hours. But, the, uh, the thing that I will say the most, so this, this is really probably the biggest lane for me is that, you know, innovative contemporary education generally appears as spot fires in schools driven by individual teachers. Yeah. When those teachers leave, that innovation disappears. Yeah. So um, another point that I remember Larry Rosenstock saying to me is that 
there's this rubber band effect in contemporary schools where you're constantly trying to stop a return or a regression to the mean and stop a return to a traditional school. It's very easy to keep returning back to the traditional school. Yes. So you need to put things in place to prevent that from happening. What's something so, that you've put in place that prevents so, Yeah, So Larry Rosenstock has one-year contracts for all his teachers. So unless they're actually moving in that direction, they've got a job. But if they don't, they don't. So that's how he keeps at that school. We Larry, can't do that here. I don't want to do that. Well, Larry Rosenstock, yeah. He was, really? he was the previous CEO of, um, of High Tech High. For us, that prevention of regression to the mean was systems and structures, and, and that includes leadership. So it would be very difficult for a new principal to come into my school and regress back to a traditional model because our timetable, our leadership structures, our systems and processes are all built around this. It couldn't, you couldn't grab what we're doing and force it into a traditional school. It just can't, it can't happen. The only way it can happen is by reimagining all of those systems and structures. Right. So it's, it'll be very difficult to regress. It could happen, but it'll be very difficult. So that for me, that's the biggest takeaway. Focus on the vision and focus yep. on systems and structures to support it. Yeah. And I think that might be a great place to uh, to leave this. Um, Doug, if you want to stay on, because I'd like to have a quick post chat um, before seven. But thanks, everyone. Ali, uh, Mr. or Miss Bowen, Anthony, Rebecca, Vanessa, Prachi, and Jenny. Thanks again. As I said, look for the um, replay link on the event page within a week. Thanks for your attendance. I thought this was fantastic because I just I just love this story. I think it's fantastic. So um, hopefully everyone got something out of this and uh, we'll see you maybe on another event. Thank you.